out here next time. Okay, the meeting shall come to order. Okay. Come to order. Um, first roll call. Here. Funderburg. Here. Johnson. Here. Lopez. Here. McFarland. Here. Moore. Here. Zimmers. Here. All members are in attendance. Okay. Um, President's report. He doesn't have one. Um, board salutes. I have a couple. Um, okay. I'd like to wish everyone good luck on the ISETS this week, the middle schools and elementary schools. Um, every day everybody does well, gets rest, and really takes it seriously this week. Um, also, I would like to do a shout out to Lindsay, Adam, and I wrote Lindsay last Friday. 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 Uh, Black History Month uh, presentation, it was excellent. Donna Jefferson coordinated all of it. It was really enjoyable. The kids did a wonderful job, and it, it was an enjoyable experience. So I'd like to thank Lindsay for inviting us. I had a couple. Um, I got to visit the ELC finally after being rescheduled a couple of times um, <laughs> because of the weather. Um, and it was, um, I did see your daughter, Mr. McFarland. Mm -hmm. She was orderly in passing. Yes. Um, She's like that. Like her mother. I was very struck by the theme of the school, which is our people are our strength. And I just thought that was very inspirational. And it's carried throughout the school. And Ms. Grove had quite a few examples to share with the staff um, how they've settled on that as their theme this year. So uh, kudos to them. Uh, I wanted to salute the um, Public Schools Foundation. I mm -hmm. think all of us, uh, almost all of us, were in attendance Saturday night at their fundraiser, and it was um, just a wonderful showcase of all of our schools and talents, and uh, hats off to them. It was nice to see um, such a great crowd supporting public education. And I'll just piggyback on what she said about the Public Schools Foundation. Um, you know, I love um, youth art. And um, we had a great display as usual. And my bouquet is a result of the talents of the district student. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten more compliments today on this cool. than you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And I bought, bought one also for um, another friend of mine, and that's her sorority colors. And I got a couple of other pieces. You know, I don't have big money, so I couldn't buy big things. But this is <laughs> probably more valuable than anything that was there because I am getting just enormous compliments on it. So cool. I can Great congratulate story. all the students who contributed their work, and I congratulate the foundation on the work that they do to assist, and the kids can have the materials to do these kind of things. There I've got a, I've got a handful here. I was staying busy the last couple of weeks. Uh, about two weeks ago after the board meeting, uh, that Thursday, Lanphier has Feed the Lions, uh, basically go out dinner with the varsity boys basketball team. And I did that uh, before their game against Jacksville and Peoria Central that uh, weekend. So Thursday went to uh, five guys with the varsity basketball team at Lanphier, with Coach Turner and Coach McBride and the other coach, he works at Franklin, his name's, I forget his name, but he was there. Kids were great. Uh, they liked to eat, uh, so I had a great time with those guys. And they actually cleaned up. They're probably the best uh, kids there. And I know Miss Gill and I had lunch with them before, and they are a really good group of kids. So I had that with that team, and then also Mitchell Lindsay with uh, Mr. Zimmers. And I want to give a huge salute to all our teachers that are working. I uh, try to go in all the schools and look where we're teaching at. And at Mitchell Lindsay, I don't know if you guys have been there. Probably most of you here have. Mr. Crum, who is my basketball coach, took me and said, I want to show you some rooms. And there's kids learning basically closets. We're teaching our kids in closets over there because we're out of space. And a little girl from the Congo was in there uh, learning English. They have 41 kids that do not speak English as their number one language. And it's this 
impressive, and I, I salute all you teachers and coaches uh, because I literally walked in there and there's six kids in a closet learning, and uh, that's a shame, but I sal uh, salute all that uh, staff. Also, Jane Adams, I see the principals back there, uh, Jennifer back there invited me to March Madness reading. Uh, they actually uh, told me I was gonna be Dr. Seuss when I showed up and I almost walked out the door. So, but I did get to participate with the kids. It's a, a great thing, so I um, like it. And I had a good time with the uh, board at the uh, dinner and my wife did spend some money and have some art, so. Thank you. I'd like to salute uh, both <coughs> Lampier and Southeast for their making the grade. Um, although I would like to have more student participation, the program is being run very well, and you know just the participants, um, you know that come and mentor. I, I want to thank each one of the mentors too, but um, I also want to um, give a salute to Lampier because with their experience of having a lot of of the making the grade events under their belt, they have willingly shared their information with Southeast and helped Southeast to build up the program that they're developing. So thank you Southeast for the great pro program, but also for Lampier for sharing your information and collaborating with Southeast. Uh, first uh, ELC, I was over there actually today, it was our family week for my daughter and I'm surprised she didn't make you get in line with them. She's very <laughs> orderly, I agree with that. Uh, but no, I, so I, I salute ELC all the time there wonderful staff. Um, they have the largest population outside of a middle school and high school over there with 700 kids and they're all five or three to five years old so it's amazing what they do over there. Uh, ditto on the foundation. I've got some SLAR in my office now which is wonderful and then also I want to salute all of the uh, s staff, uh, students, and fans from Lanphier who went to the Lincoln game, specifically the teachers who acted as chaperones for the student contingent who went uh, when the student contingent got there, we found out that uh, Lincoln hadn't given us a student section and there was no seating, <laughs> but uh, the Lanphier fans immediately got up, moved out of the way for the students, and there was absolutely no problem because all the fans and the students and the teachers worked together. So um, it was a rough game, however, um, nothing but good sportsmanship from everyone who was there from Lanphier. Well, Mr. President, I have one more. I see Dr. Leverett sitting back there. I went on a recruiting trip with uh, Kim Leverett a couple weeks ago at UIS, is that what it was? People, she is good. I mean, she does a good <laughs> job. If, if somebody's going to get us some candidates here, she's going to do it. But she not only recruits teachers, she helps parents with problems. I mean, there are all kinds of things she did that day outside of the scope of recruiting teachers. So good job, Dr. Leverett. New business. Nothing. The uh, 4.3, the change to board policies regarding physicals and immunizations. Mr. Flamini and members of the board, I'm actually going to pull this item tonight at 20 minutes to 4. I uh, was informed that in what we were proposing to you was incomplete. There's uh, a section. Uh, that should be added about eye exams that parallels what we put in the policy about dental exams. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, I don't think this is a big thing where we'll have the policy changed and, w and the important thing is that we've announced to people the rolling forward of the exclusion date. This is, you remember a conversation in a meeting or two ago about working from an old board policy book? So I worked from an old board policy book that talked about dental but didn't talk about eyes. So uh, um, thanks to uh, uh, the good work of uh, 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 the person who uh, is in charge of our nursing program. She actually took the time to review the policy and go, whoa, it's missing something. And uh, she's also provided we, me with enough information that I won't have to work very hard to write the rules and regs that go with the policy, uh, uh, things that um, uh, building administrators and other staff will need to know to administer it. So we'll bring it the next time we'll have everything in it that's supposed I to just, be. I it. just have a question. Um, since we've established that date, are you getting much feedback from people now that people are starting to know it? Um, So 
word must be getting out. Parents are taking their kids. They're getting some physical assault. I'm hoping that we continue to spread the word. We're putting up some flyers all over the schools. We're just starting to get them out into public places. But, you know, actually I have some with me that I was going to take and put up. These are like little tear-offs at the bottom of CCHC and SIU. Um, their number's at the bottom. It just says, you know, who needs physicals and immunization. So we're planning on getting these throughout the Springfield area also. Thank you. Thank you. So, the word's out. I had a question, Dr. Hill, too. You know, we've been focusing on the, the medical exams and the ramifications if the medical exams aren't being completed in a timely manner. Is that also going to, is something similar <coughs> going to be reflected in the dental and the eye exam? Um, we don't exclude students for the, for the failure. Uh, there's a report that we have to, to, to um, uh, turn into the state, mm -hmm. and, and the state's taken a different, it, it's, it's, we all know that healthy kids have dental and eye exams. Uh, and so the legislation uh, strongly suggests that it requires that these things be turned in at, I can't remember which grade levels are which. Um, right. Kindergartners and anybody new to the district need to get is an eye exam. on on the eye exams, so um, the consequences are different. But we obviously promote, mm -hmm. and I think the pediatricians in town do too. So for people who who actually go to the doctor for the physical exams, they're more likely to get this. Um, uh, folks who don't have. Um, a, a regular stop in their lives for medical care are the ones that are most likely to need our support in this area to make sure they get dental and eye exams. Mm -hmm. But the consequences are different. We don't exclude. Okay. 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 No presentations to the board. Am I correct? Um, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on that one just for a few minutes. Okay. Um, the uh, business reports, Joe, we have. <coughs> President Flamini, members of the board, attached is a summary of revenue and expenditures for the month of February 2014 for the education and the operations and maintenance funds. Uh, the account receivable outstanding report is also attached as of February outstanding uh, state payments total $3.8 million. The education fund revenues for February were $7.3 million, with expenditures totaling $8.4 million, and expenditures exceeding revenues by $1.1 million. Operations and maintenance fund revenues for the month were $200, and expenditures were $836,000, with expenditures exceeding revenues by $836,000. Any questions? Yes, on the money that the state owes you for the current fiscal year, not for the current, yes, for the current fiscal year. Okay, any questions for Mr. Basco? Thank you. The next item is um, the public hearing regarding the amended budget. I want to call everybody's attention. The, this is not the part of the, the um, agenda where we're talking about proposed budget cuts for next year. Uh, by a matter of coincidence, this is about the uh, board's consideration of the amended budget for the FY14 budget. That budget's been in their hands for um, a couple of weeks now. And so what we need to do, Mr. Flamini, is adjourn the, the meeting we're in, reconvene in a public hearing, invite public comment on the amended FY14 budget, and then adjourn that meeting and come back into the meeting that we're adjourning out of. Okay. Uh, do we have a, someone moving that we adjourn I, that meeting? I'll move that we recess the regular meeting and okay. that we um, conduct a hearing, public hearing on the amended budget. Second. Thunderbird? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lopez? Aye. McFarland? Aye. Moore? Aye. Zimmers? Aye. Flamini? Aye. That is seven aye votes. Okay, we're in public hearing. Mr. Basco, do you have any preliminary comments? <laughs> no, um, it's been just the, we've had no changes since the budget originally went on file, so we're still looking at um, okay. same, same numbers. 
Is there any member of the public who wishes to address the board relative to the amended FY14 budget? <coughs> Need a motion to do that. Motion to end public hearing and move back into primary session. Second. First, second. Um, Johnson. Aye. Lopez. Aye. McFarland. Aye. Moore. Aye. Zimmers. Aye. Fulmini. Aye. Thunderbird. Aye. That is seven aye votes. The motion carries. Superintendent's report. Yeah. I just I want to start by making a comment, uh, springboarding off of. Uh, S'mores comments about making the grade. I too visited making the grade at Lamphere in Southeast. And I want to encourage, uh, I, I know that um, other board members have uh, uh, served in the past in this activity. Uh, I told both schools I uh, want to be considered as someone to, to uh, sit and talk to kids and talk about their futures. Uh, I'm really, really impressed with the making the grade program. Um, it's you know in different stages of development I think some of you are aware that we kind of hit a stumbling block this year relative to parental permission that we went from an opt-out to an opt-in that that has reduced the number of students participating I would still say that I thought participation was good and I think for those students who take the time <coughs> to come down it's very beneficial to get to talk to one or more members of the community about their future plans uh, so, um, I'll, if you're not getting an invitation, I'll make certain that the people of both schools include you on the invitation list. Uh, I haven't yet done it, so I can't speak from firsthand experience about how rewarding it is, but I know that those of you who've done it think it is, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And let me just say this, generally when it's hell, not making an excuse, but we're in session or yeah. something but never fear that I am counseling students and looking for scholarships and all kinds of opportunities for them and and yeah unfortunately for, for, for it's probably in conflict with work schedules for some folks no doubt about it and if I retire then people are really not going to see me in school so I've thought about it <laughs> so you better pray I keep working well you know I said that once, and look how that worked out for me. <laughs> um, I, I, Dr. Hill, before yeah. you start on your topics, um, I had a question for you. Um, the I've had several questions since the article ran about Southeast's um, choir program doing additional fundraising. Can you address the measures that the district has taken to help make <coughs> Southeast whole? Yeah, I can. Um, you know, so first of all, we're in the process of filing. Um, an insurance claim to recover the lost funds but in the meantime the board uh, graciously um, uh, loaned what sort of our version of a working cash fund uh, to uh, Southeast High School that Mr. Wynn has administered very skillfully so that no student would suffer the loss of a program uh, f uh, from the unfortunate incident that occurred there so it's been a couple of weeks, uh, maybe three weeks ago, that Mr. Basco and I were there. At the time, there was still a $23,000 balance in the $40,000 loan account. It's money in and out. But if somebody, you know, let's just say that when the dust cleared, they had $2,000 in their account, and they had originally uh, raised 6000 then th the loan that we made would allow Mr. Wynn to make that group whole so they could participate in the activity uh, and then they would fundraise and as they put money back into the account it would build their balances back up and when we get the insurance settlement back uh, back on this uh, those those accounts will be made entirely whole uh, and until that time we've developed a process through somebody's very good foresight before I got here to make certain that students didn't, didn't suffer. Uh, at the high school level in certain activities, it's a perpetual, never-ending fundraising journey. Uh, uh, music programs probably being at the top of the list, and, and um, I know that uh, high school music programs, um, in order to attract students, uh, take on 
the trips and travel that are expensive, in my opinion, really good investments. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't read the article, but um, um, I do want to reemphasize that uh, we've taken lots of steps to make certain that students don't suffer from the loss of the funds there. Thank you. Uh, we want to announce tonight um, so, sort of the benchmark dates for the 2014-2015 uh, calendar. Uh, the reason we can't release the full calendar at this time is that a committee that's made up of uh, district level personnel and representatives of the SEA uh, continue to work on a plan that will make early dismissal Wednesdays a reality next school year. Uh, but until that process of study review uh, is completed by that committee, uh, we're not able to release uh, all the details of the calendar. But we're very well aware that, that significant numbers of parents want us to be able to say when the first day of school will be, where the benchmark dates are for vacations. So. The first day of school in the coming school year will be on August 19th. The winter break will begin on December 22nd and end on January 2nd. Spring break will run from March 30th to April 3rd. And the last day of school will be May the 26th next year. And I say with all confidence there will be no snow or bad weather days next year. Um, um, so. We really will end on May the 26th, which will be the day after Memorial Day if all works out well. Uh, so I know that people have been waiting to hear that. We'll publicize this through, we'll, we'll put it on the website and some other things so that people know, uh, so they can arrange their planning. And I've foreshadowed a little bit, but we're uh, anticipating uh, uh, late start days. I probably said early dismissal, didn't I, before? No, did I say late start? I always mix my metaphors. Late start days on Wednesdays next year uh, as a way of uh, arranging for collaboration time for teachers, uh, a practice that's been quite successful in some other school districts. And we'll be telling you more about that down the road. Okay. Um, several uh, board members. Uh, communicated with me when through various channels you became aware that the Illinois School Security Grant application was being floated around. I want to call on Daryl Shaver uh, to share with you uh, the, the application that we're planning to make in that program. Daryl? Certainly. Thank you. Um, yeah, the uh, Illinois uh, Emergency Management Agency, I got that right, IEMA, as a uh, Funding, uh, I think it's $25 million uh, dollars in grants to uh, schools, um, elementary, uh, all through basically every school in the, every pro, not, uh, every public school in, in the state. And uh, you have to make, it's primarily set to, uh, to take care of your primary entry, primary public <coughs> entry. Um, and, and take care of that. They they indicate three items: uh, locks, doors, glass. Um, if you can self-certify uh, that you have taken care of those items, then you can try for secondary uh, policies, and that's what uh, our program. And that's kind of where we're leaning towards uh, in in our request, uh, Rick. Uh, Mr. Sanders and I have uh, looked at it and uh, started the process and uh, we're eligible for up to uh, $370,000 about, but if you divide that by 34 buildings, <laughs> it's not very much per building. We kind of are focusing on the middle schools at this time um, for this go-around of grants and uh, in terms of and going for secondary uh, programs which would be um, classroom door hardware some of our some of our classroom door hardware is, is uh, quite old dating back to the 50s uh, so we would go in with uh, we're thinking intruder type uh, 
blocks, where you can lock from the inside of the classroom a lot more efficiently than the ones we have now. Yeah. Another option is to try for a camera, <coughs> security cameras in that, uh, in those facilities, which will enable first responders to, uh, when they come to a building, to access those that system and uh, see into the building before they even get into the building. Yeah. This is not exactly related to this, but just coincidentally, I had uh, lunch with Director Munkin of IEMA a few days ago, and there is uh, Ready Schools that is going to be rolling out. They've only rolled out higher education, uh, and they're working on pilot programs for school districts, and he is interested in talking to the district about Great. potentially making Springfield a pilot for the Ready Schools. Um, so I was going to uh, get him in touch with the superintendent, but just a heads Great. up that it kind of meshes together there. Yeah. Perfect. So he is interested in that. Wonderful. Mr. Right. Shaver, would those improvements if we're if we're given that grant money, would those improvements be for next school year? Um or that quickly? They are they they are supposed to be given out uh, in May, hmm. the grants. And you're 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 supposed to be prepared to expend them in a year. Huh. Okay. Um that's another thing we didn't go up we we're not thinking of going after thirty four of them because um, because of the timeline of trying to get it uh, implemented. Mm -hmm. um, they give you half the funds to begin with and then half at, 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 at the end. So if we use an outside contractor, they'll be have to be aware, you may have to, they'll have to be aware if that's how the funding comes. Right. It's, it's half first. Are you selecting the schools? you're going to do what rooms in the school work we we uh, we discussed the middle school the five middle schools okay. um, to, to do this pilot program it would be all the doors interior doors all modifying interior doors to uh, to have the modern we, we call them intruder locks but you can lock the door from the inside some of them you can now um, but they're with the old, the old uh, dead bolts, which I can't remember when they were modified in the past. Um, those old, those old dead bolts were modified to be lockable from the inside. However, they that? were never made to be modified, and, yeah. and they were modified. But they were selling them to be that. I know for the high schools through a grant, we got money. We have several that. buildings that have. Have the new intruder locks, uh, the new thing with Rowan and Enos. We'll have yeah. the new intruder locks. Um, Marsh has those, those rooms have intruder locks. So, what the project we did there, and I think there's there's others. Some of our locks we have you have to go outside the room to lock it. Mm -hmm. It's an old Toss style classroom lock. So, as we try to get more grants, we'll try to filter this through the through the district. Kind of need a starting point and so it, we kind of went with the, the middle schools. Thanks. So Thank you went with the middle schools. Um, have you thought about maybe going um, in some areas where you think it might be a little bit rougher or where there's been or you have to have an occasional lockdown? Consideration, and are you considering? You're talking about this outside. You said maybe an outside contractor. We don't have right. um, laborers or people in our district who handle keys and oh, yeah, those kind can. of things. That we could do yeah. it in house and maybe save we some money. We have personnel that can surely accomplish this. Um, so here's the rub: if we use our internal people, uh, part of this. So. You just can't go into schools on school days and start taking doors off and replacing doors. You have to move people and so on. So um, uh, it may be possible, for in instance, with contractors to establish some off-school hours to have this done and so on. Uh, so if we assign our 
carpenters to do this. I guess it would be a carpenter's job. Yes. It, would. Uh, it means that they won't be doing the other things that they would be doing during that time. And, and because it's grant dollars, um, uh, we may, be, you know, we might be able to get a contractor who would install the doors between 4 o'clock and 9 o'clock at night or something like that, which wouldn't be feasible, although maybe it's some combination of the two. Uh, but oftentimes on projects like this, the reason you contract out is so you don't have to pull every carpenter in the district off for, I'm guessing it's a three or four month job to change out every door in the middle schools. Or yeah, and it's, it's not every door that we're replaced. Some, of, some are doors and hardware, some are just hardware. Okay. It depends on the door, sure. it depends on the hardware that's there. Um, so it's really a combination of a lot of things. Um, just to put uh, this type of lock on. And then there's you know, the possibility of putting cameras in too. We can certainly do that with our own forces too, but then you are you are taking away um, from other activities, that maintenance activities that they're doing. Okay, well my main concern is that if we have employees that can be utilized in these activities, that we ought to start there first, and maybe we don't have to, you know, maybe some of these people that talking about laying off and all this other kind of stuff, we can utilize their services before we do that. So we don't have to give away all the money. We can use some of it in-house. Okay. Any other questions on that? Okay, so the next item is the recommended budget cuts. Mr. Fellini, it's my recommendation that after I make my presentation, the board has whatever discussion it's going to have. But I know you've got people signed up to speak on this issue. It seems to me it would be appropriate to have them speak <coughs> after those other things have happened. So um, let's see if we can get up on the screen the suggested cuts. Okay, so um, as a bit of context, uh, board members know that we met here a week ago yesterday. Uh, in a work session uh, regarding the budget and on that day um, uh, that evening I gave you a list that looked a lot like what's up on the screen not totally uh, this reflects some of your input and some of your questions but it's generally that particular um, uh, uh, list although the the number of positions to be cut in some of the items that appear near the top uh, reflect more accurate numbers uh, after Ms. Sherman has gone through uh, staffing allocations and so uh, some of the numbers that were estimate estimates last week are now known to be real numbers so you know I will repeat the same contextual introduction tonight that I did last week um, we've spent uh, a month or so taking a look at our um, overall budget picture and how it is that we arrived here with the need to cut approximately 4.7 million dollars. You'll remember back in uh, January and early February we showed you uh, kind of a high level estimate of revenues for next year. Uh, we showed you a visual of what would happen if we just rolled the budget uh, uh, and just rolling the budget uh, had um, uh, the gross sum of $500,000 added to it uh, relative to employee raises or what or step moves I think is, is uh, educational increments uh, but it had no uh, uh, no leeway built in for uh, raises for any employee group uh, or for even step moves on uh, salary schedules where step moves are, are part of the process and that was all uh, shared with you last Monday night and in those discussions we identify the budget shortfall of 4.7 million dollars so the page that you see before you relative to what's called the first level reduction uh, has a number of $4.8 million, which is um, uh, an attempt, if you will, to get to that first estimate of 4.7 to plug the hole. My portrayal of this list of cuts is that 
these are things that um, I would suspect if you approve these cuts for the most parts these reductions will be made and that un unless there's a significant change in state aid coming our way for the better downstream uh, that you probably will not have a significant opportunity <coughs> at least for next year to, to restore uh, most of the cuts on this page. Uh, so that's the context. Let me go down the list and see if you have any questions. Um, as I mentioned last week, um, there are a lot of places in our budget where we have uh, substitutes for various and sundry positions across the district. Um, I believe we can tighten our belt and, and find some ways to um, um, cut $100,000 out of uh, our substitute budgets without impacting the quality of education that students are receiving. Um, there's a recommendation to uh, reduce three elementary teaching positions. We have um, done budget or uh, staffing allocations and all of those have been turned in and the three that we estimated turned out to be uh, borne out in uh, the staffing for the elementary schools. Principals turned in uh, to Gina uh, staffing requests that show three fewer elementary classroom teachers next year than we're using this year. Uh, at the middle school, last week we had projected six positions. Uh, when the dust cleared on this, we see a reduction of five positions. So we missed the estimate by one. Um, you will recall that the majority, and, and let me say that in the case of elementary and middle school, um, uh, those cuts, none of those cuts uh, uh, is related to program change, they just reflect uh, changes in enrollment and uh, um, an attempt on our part to be more efficient in staffing. The high school teaching positions is a different matter. Uh, back in January, uh, you uh, took action to uh, approve a change in the seven period day where next year high school teachers will teach six periods instead of seven taking us back to, if you will, to the staffing patterns that existed before we went to the seven period day. When we did that, we estimated the increase in the number of regular education teaching positions was around 30. That's why we put 30 in as the target. When the allocations were turned in, we saw that we could reduce 26. So we actually were not able to make the 30 position cuts, but 26 is the, is the real number. Um, at the same time that we changed the, the if you will, the, the workload for the regular ed teachers at the high school, uh, special education teachers will also have six contact periods a day instead of, in, instead of the five. And so there's an efficiency in any special education self-contained classroom. So um, uh, I'm still showing nine on here late in the day today uh, <clears throat> Gina confirmed for me that it's actually eight so the savings is slightly less in this um, um, and and here I, I really do want to uh, thank Gina for her tireless work in sorting this all out uh, she's um, uh, guided and coached lots of principals in their staff allocation and and help figure all this out with the special education staffing so She's been an active participant, uh, participant in uh, making staffing decisions for the middle and high schools in particular, and uh, I just want to thank her for doing such a good job. Uh, the special education attendants, uh, we're estimating 10 positions across the system. Um, they are not, some may be related to the high school, but um, uh, I'm going to come back and make some comments about special ed cuts uh, when I get to the bottom of the list. Uh, recommend the, uh, uh, reducing 4.5 elementary library positions. I know we discussed this in last week's meeting um, um, after a great deliberation. Those cuts stay on the list at this point in time. 
Uh, one elementary secondary uh, secretary position is on the list. Uh, this represents a vacancy that exists now and, and wouldn't be um, uh, filled. Uh, we talked quite a bit last week about security. Um, I sensed that you wanted to make some reductions in the cost of security, but that you most certainly did not want to give up coverage of buildings. And uh, Mr. Sanders um, brought me an idea for doing that. Um, he's going to make sure I say this correctly, and if not, he's going to signal me down and, and correct me. But if we turn the hands of time back to before the days when uh, the city got the cops and school grant or whatever it was. Uh, it was during my superintendency. I know Karen Acero was mayor and um, uh, the city began to get the resources from this external grant to put uniformed uh, officers in the schools as uh, S SRO, SSOs, SRO. SROs. And so up until that time we had put uniformed policemen in schools uh, hired uh, on an hourly basis through the police benevolent. That was my experience as a high school principal as that, that we had uniformed policemen in the building who were hired, who were contracted individually as opposed to through the police department. Um, so when the city lost the grant, we kept the, the uh, model and so the cost of police officers in the school is not only their salaries, uh, but their benefits and so on. And so what we're recommending doing here is going back to, pay it, to not paying for the salaries and benefits of po for policemen to work in high schools, but having the same number of hours of coverage through hiring <laughs> off-duty police officers at, a, at an hourly rate where we wouldn't be paying for the benefits and so on. Uh, we did not we, we did not cut coverage anywhere else. Elementary schools that have security officers this year would continue to have them next year. Uh, and middle school coverage would remain the same and so on. So uh, this cut, I, don't, I think it was listed as $200,000 last week on my guesstimate. It comes out to be 180,000. Rick, did I get any of that right? Well, actually looking at Okay, good. Everything else is fine. Okay, right. Um, we talked about the uh, private institution tuitions. Uh, there's a program called Lakeshore that's administered by HOPE. Um, uh, it's a program for uh, students who have uh, very unique uh, uh, social emotional needs. Uh, the history on this is we entered into an agreement a number of years ago with HOPE. Uh, we're guaranteed 24 slots uh, and at the very beginning of the contract we paid for 24 slots and if we didn't use the slots we still paid. Uh, this current year we're paying for 20 slots uh, and we're not using the 20 slots. So we are recommending uh, that we uh, negotiate with HOPE to take the number of guaranteed slots down to 12 and uh, so the reduction of eight slots is a saving of $367,804. So you can see that one of those slots is pretty expensive. Uh, the long range plan, and we're not ready to go there next school year, but I've talked to uh, Ms. Baker about this. The long, run pl long term plan will bring this program back into the district. Uh, we provide teachers in the program now. Um, um, and we believe that um, we'll be able to bring this program in-house and have additional dollars of savings in your future. <coughs> okay. The reduction in the technology expenditures, the Apple lease, uh, $1.4 million. Uh, we're leaving about $600,000 uh, in the budget in a general category of technology. Um, the way I envision this is that a, a triad of people, which would be uh, Superintendent Gill and the Director of the Department of Teaching and Learning and the Director of uh, 
technology, uh, Mr. Qualls, that the three of them would have the flexibility to allocate that money where they see fit. So I mean, one theme uh, that runs throughout here is in making these cuts is to do it in a way that still allows uh, the new superintendent uh, <clears throat> some flexibility in making decisions about going forward. But, you know, as I said weeks ago, we ought to be, in the ideal world, we ought to be trying to spend three million dollars a year to keep our technology current, but that's just not in the cards <coughs> financially. Now, Mr. Basco was very helpful in identifying some other cost cuts that we didn't talk about last week. We can reduce audit and management service costs. Uh, those are purchase services by uh, 48300 uh, We can make a $25,000 cut, non-personnel cut, in the Department of Teaching and Learning. Uh, we are recommending uh, uh, that we not spend the $47,500 on the IMSA after school program and that uh, mostly out of my shop we found another $16,000 in cuts around purchase services. I do want to say this about the IMSA after school program. We're not suggesting that we stop doing the program. Uh, we are suggesting that we find an alternative funding source outside of the end fund for it. So um, uh, I don't know, uh, Kathy, if you can describe in any better detail what that program does. Um, I know it serves a number of, I believe, middle school students after school. And um, um, I, I want to emphasize we are hopeful of being find, finding an alternative funding source. Right. We have, we have a couple of elementary programs as well. Um, and we do also use Title II dollars to support the, uh, the professional development that the teachers get, which is valuable, and um, I think Title II could continue to support some of that, but um, the part that comes out of the Ed Fund would be where we would be seeking other, um, other resources for that. And um, the children that, and the parents that are in the program now really do enjoy it, so it's something that we want to try to find some other way. Do you know how many students are involved in it right now? You know, we've had to reduce um, reduce the number of programs that we've had um, over the years, um, but um, each school that has it has anywhere from 20 to 50, just depending on, on the thing. So no, I don't have the most current numbers, but I can get them for you. And the cost for this program is salaries? Or is it for salaries for or? teachers, um, right, they, they do the after school um, you know, teaching, and then also there's a fee that you pay to EMSA. Um, so it just kind of adds up. Okay, um, you want to put the second screen up? So as we spoke last week, um, it was clear that um, it would be helpful to the board for me to stretch beyond the 4.7. Uh, so uh, what's on this second page um, being called the, if you will, the, the second level of cuts somehow the heading got cut off of this, but it, there should be a heading that says second level of cuts. I would portray these differently than the first page. Uh, I would say to you that in the event of a hopeful or positive um, uh, scenario relative to state aid, and depending on the outcome of your contract negotiations with employee groups, that uh, if you have the opportunity to put things back, that um, certainly have included things on this page that I could say in great honesty to you that you should and could and should consider um, uh, returning or refunding. Uh, I'm also going to make some comments about some other things not on this list that you have to think about also if you get to the place down the road where you can put things back. So uh, recommended um, uh, laying off uh, two bricklayers and a laborer. Uh, the laborer, the bricklayers don't lay bricks without the laborer, so these positions all go together. And uh, I want to address a couple of questions that I was asked. So it, it says, well, how do we really save money uh, by doing this? I know this was discussed uh, last year. So 
there's a couple of assumptions you could make. Uh, one set of assumptions would say this is not cost savings and the other set of assumptions would say it is. So if the district laid off the bricklayers and the laborer and continued to do what I'll call routine masonry repair <coughs> and you contracted it out, there would be no savings here. In fact, outside contractors to do the same amount of work would cost more than to have our internal people do it. We know that. That's why we have internal uh, tradesmen. If you assume, however, that you're going to not do routine masonry work in the next year and that the only masonry repairs that you would do would be something that would uh, threaten structural integrity or cause water to leak or things like that, then what you would do is only repair those that arose in an emergency. And we would be able to make a, an emergency life safety amendment because the problem would threaten the safety and well-being of kids. It's funded in a different source. You would contract that work out and fix it. So in essence, this is sort of like maintaining your car. Regular and routine maintenance, which we all know is the right thing to do and, and, and the right long range thing to do, would say don't cut these brick layers. Um, the emergency of not having enough money to pay for all the things that we want here, just like in our home budgets, cause us to say, well, what can we identify that we're, if, if you will, that we're willing to take some risk on this year and, and hope that we don't have a major problem? Now, in this case, if we do have a bad leak or, or something that's relative to masonry work, then we could repair it through life safety work. So that's the assumption under which that those cuts are proposed as a cost savings. Uh, the second uh, item on the list is to uh, eliminate the coordinator of video and television services. This ought not to be a very hard one for you to understand. That coordinator of video and television services is sitting about 25 feet from us all. What's the impact of this cut? In my opinion, if this is cut and not restored, channel 22 goes off the air. Uh, and I don't want to simplify a description of his work to say it's only keeping channel 22 going. Uh, I heard from principals and others that the opportunity to have things videoed, whether they go on channel 22 or not, is a, a good service to the district. The next item are the positions of webmaster and tech trainer. Um, we have uh, a couple of different names for tech trainers. Um, uh, the tech trainer we're talking about here is an individual who has been a part of the development of all the technology that exists in the district today in which we take great pride. Um, uh, and she actually years ago stepped out of a teaching position to take a non-teaching position um, uh, and has trained, I think it's fair to say, certainly hundreds and probably over a thousand people in how to use the technology. I think the position of webmaster is self-explanatory. Um, uh, if and when the opportunity comes to restore these positions, um, uh, I definitely could make the case for why either or both of the positions are necessary. Now, one of the things that I want to point out about the, the reduction of all the positions that I've just named, uh, bricklayers, laborers, coordinators of video and TV, uh, uh, tech trainer, webmaster, it was clear to me in your conversation last week that you said keep the cuts as far from teachers and classroom instruction as you can. I would insult no one's intelligence by making the statement that cutting these won't have a negative impact. They'll have a negative impact, but they do not touch teachers. They, they, those positions can be eliminated and no teacher gets riffed. Okay. Uh, we found um, supplies and materials. In essence, what this $20,000 cut is, is supplies and materials outside of the classroom. I've assured principals we are not cutting the building allocations to buy supplies and materials for students. Okay. Uh, the next position is volunteer coordinator. 
Um, uh, I believe this position was eliminated last year and then restored. Uh, I talked to the individual in the position today. Um, you have asked me several times about grant writing. This individual uh, in the position, it's a one-person shop, uh, does do some grant writing, does spends maybe as much as half of her time um, uh, doing grant writing. Uh, new teacher mentor. Uh, we have two of these mentors whose job it is is to make sure that our new teachers get off to a good start. Um, this position is the first on this page that if it's reduced actually knocks a low seniority teacher off the log. Um, I said to principals the other day, I'm having a hard time seeing a scenario in which we're going to have large numbers of new teachers next year. Now, if, having said that, um, uh, we are giving, well, it, it's, I, that's not the right statement, we're not giving serious considerations. Plans are underway to completely redo <coughs> the model for supporting teachers and uh, principals learning around content area and technology. So I think someone on the board raised the issue last week about, so have we gotten to the point with teacher instructional leaders that there are so few they can't serve the needs of all the schools? Uh, the plan going forward, and this was discussed before I got here, so the first day I was here I heard about it, um, is to take the TILs who have subject area responsibility, mostly language arts and math, along with those who have technology responsibility, along with those who mentor new teachers, and put them all on one team, cross-train their skill sets, have them be led by two coordinators, uh, and have that team of people be the group that provides instructional support for teachers and principals. So it's, that model is only partially driven by finances and is more largely driven by, if you will, a more informed and progressive way to approach this. But it also has an efficiency in it uh, that, if you will, has been the need for which has been created by the reduction of TILs in recent years. Uh, so the, certainly the new teacher mentor fits in that. Uh, we are, even in the, in the proposal of the uh, new model, listing one teacher instructional leader as a possible cut here. And the special education secretary position, I think I told you last week, would not require if you will, a RIF notice for anybody. Uh, that was based on someone who was going to leave a position to take uh, a different position, and that person ended up not leaving the position. So the reduction of a secretary in special ed <coughs> would, in fact, cause a rift in the secretary ranks. So my closing comments are these. Um, hopefully we get to the point downstream in this process where the state aid scenario is more positive than we've projected it to be in our conservative estimates and the board's in a position to consider with your new superintendent what it is that you restore there are some things that you're not cutting now but that have been cut in the past that need to go back on this list, in my opinion. There have been two special education supervisors cut in the last several years, and neither position uh, has been replaced. And we've talked a lot about uh, special education uh, during these uh, hearings. And I think uh, we really have to ask ourselves if we have the appropriate number of people and the appropriate combinations of people to manage the programs and that at least some of the concerns that we've raised about the special ed model could be related to being understaffed in the supervisory ranks. So I think you're going to have to give some attention to that. Uh, the director of technology, 
uh, which was a position that traditionally in this district has been headed by someone who combines technology skills with the skill set of a teacher uh, has not been filled and when I made the case I think fairly passionately a couple of meetings ago about your long-range look at technology uh, I would suggest going forward that you really need to seriously uh, consider uh, taking a look you know and I would repeat to say again um, there are things on this page that for which I think the total elimination uh, would would really cause some problems it's hard for me to imagine maintaining our very good uh, web website without at least some type of attention to a webmaster and um, uh, truthfully one reason our district excels at technology is because of our use of technology now I'm not you know I, I, I'm trying to here leave as much if you will flexibility in the decision making going forward for both the board and the new superintendent but I would be remiss not to call to your attention at least some of my concerns so there they are um, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions or sit back and watch you all have hold conversation with each other or do what you need to do to go forward uh, I must say um, this is a most unpleasant task um, uh, I would never insult anyone impacted by it by <clears throat> not saying that um, it's a traumatic thing in the lives of people to lose their jobs and to be riffed. Uh, I know that from first-hand experience as a young teacher and uh, I've been through it a number of times as a superintendent and it's I don't see any way not to do it uh, uh, but it's not pleasant and I know it isn't for you either. So there you go. Uh -oh. I've had it. <coughs> I'll take the lead because I'm, I know I'm always the one that is against the cuts, and I'm, I, I'm against these cuts. Um, Dr. Hill talked about a new model. I don't know where, I'd like to ask you where the new model came from and how much consulting you did with the new uh, superintendent because if we're doing a new model now, in 45 days we'll have, well maybe closer to 60 days, we'll have a new superintendent. And um, so are we going to reinvent the wheel again? Uh, I have a problem. I see some things in some of these cuts, especially in the secondary cuts, that affect how people in this district get to know what's going on in the district. Cutting out the video and the television series, a lot of people watch this because they do. They don't come to the meetings unfortunately, but they do keep uh, an eye on what we are doing in the district. Uh, cutting out the um, webmaster and the tech trainer. I don't know why the tech trainer or one of those positions can't, when you talk about filling the director of technology, can't assume that position. Um, yeah. I, all of these teaching position cuts. I wonder how you break those down, especially the high school ones per building. Who, who, who's, Gina, are the numbers equal in the buildings? Gina, can you address that? You probably can answer that specifically. The uh, high school cuts uh, will not be exactly, exactly equal per building because some buildings have more um, certificated or regular education teachers and some buildings have more special education teachers depending on the population of the building. So Springfield High School would take the largest cut but they have the largest staff out of, out of these this regular ed number that you're looking at. And then Southeast and then Lane Fair actually would take the smallest but really it's based on the size of their staff. 
And, and that's based on student and enrollment. And that's based on student enrollment, yes. So the, the idea is that now each teacher can teach six periods instead of five. That's what that cut is completely based on. Do you have a change in the model? I, I know enrollment's not anywhere near there yet, but do you have any idea how that breakout works between Springfield, Southeast, and Lancaster? On projected enrollment yeah. for next year? Well, I mean, not projected enrollment. How many reductions per school? Yes, it was, um, I don't have it in front of me at the top of my head, it was nine at uh, Springfield. Let's see. I can pull that up right away. Thank you. Uh, you while you're, while you're looking up that number, um, uh, you, you asked a number of questions. One I can address is about the change in the model for the TILs. Um, um, I can tell you that uh, uh, Mrs. Gill has had full level of input to it. Uh, she's present and she can speak to it if she chooses. I'm not going to call on her, but if she stands up, I'm also not going to say don't speak. But she can, she, can, <laughs> she can address that. But, you know, you raise a legitimate current concern. Are we going to change the model and then have a new superintendent? And the answer to that is no. So, do you want to speak to that, Jennifer? Just briefly state that, you know, my concern is as we reduce the department from last year to this year, still maybe even reducing that even lower, we need to think out of the box and think creatively. Um, Kathy called and just kind of picked my brain about what I thought about a model that would look cross, you know, cross different uh, genres, you know, with, whether it's math, literacy, and technology. And truthfully, what we found in the district that I'm currently in yeah. is that if you do work in a cross um, kind of really integrated way, then that technology is getting integrated at a, at a higher level because it really is within the core subjects that you're integrating uh, the technology. And so that becomes a really strong way. Um, and as we know with Common Core, the types of thinking that uh, they're really asking us to do really goes across all subjects, social studies, science, as well as math and literacy. So I think this is a pretty strong model to bring those changes. Um, I don't know all the details. It was just kind of a surface level, but I will continue to work with the programs that are started this year and, and really help um, benefit them in the future. How, how many people are we talking if you combine the TL, TILs between technology, math, and literature? Eight. TILs and two coordinators. So that's the total between the three programs? Yes. Okay. I think I'm close. And with this model, we feel like we're going to get better service. Because what I'm hearing, as we have reduced every year, and God love these people that are the TILs because they really are experts at what they do. And I really admire the jobs they do. But what I keep consistently hearing in the current model, we're not getting the bang for the buck because they can't get to the schools like they used to. And I guess my question is, uh, with this combination of these people, are we anticipating that schools are going to receive a little more service? Yes, a little more I consistent think, service. Yeah, I, guess, I think what we're feeling, we're all feeling, is um, <coughs> sort of the perfect storm <coughs> of reduction of um, reduction of resources while we're having an increase in the amount of mandates and the Common Core and the things we've had to respond to. So now we're in a place where our um, curriculum has been aligned so we can um, stop spending time on that because we have well, we'll always spend time on that but we don't have to focus on it so much we um, are better able to have um, some specific focus areas through the Danielson model we have one focus area in each thing and um, I think when you know better you do better I know that and so um, I feel like we're at a place where our skill sets are ready and the people that we have in place are ready to do this um, and everyone is, um, I think we've been trying, they've, they've continued to try to do the same amount of things that they've done before with, with frankly half the people that they've had before. And we are um, ready to focus in on just a few areas where they can go deeply and I think people will see the difference. And the one, one TIL that we have, uh, teacher instructional leader, is that a person that is retiring? That's correct. That's okay, you're not replacing that person. Unfortunately, no, but you know, I'll keep trying if we can, but no, that well, right I'd now, like that's to, I'd like to see us bring it back, all back to where we were five, six years ago, but you know, I know we can't do that right now. Okay. Well, when you talk about focus areas, uh, be specific, what, what kind of focus areas So in the Danielson about? framework, there's um, four domains. Um, the first domain is planning and preparation, and inside that 
under that um, domain, we'll be focusing in on um, assessments, and we have to focus in on that because uh, student growth is going to be mandated, and so we need to help our teachers and our administrators know how to write good assessments and analyze the data, so that'll be a very strong focus area. And then domain two is the classroom environment. Um, we've always had a, a good um, focus on the culture, creating a, a culture in the classroom. And so the culture inside the classrooms will be a second focus area. In a now, wait, 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 wait. Cla Col domain culture two. in the classrooms. It Correct. Like creating a classroom, just a good culture for learning inside the classrooms. That's un under the Daniels Danielson framework. That's. Um, in the domain of classroom environment, um, creating a culture for learning is one of the areas of focus in there. E under the um, Danielson framework, there's there's four domains, and under each domain, there's several areas that the teachers have to attend to. So we've chosen one in each area. And in so domain two, we've looked at culture. In domain three, which is an instruction, um, we're looking at engagement of students. And then in domain four, which is professionalism, we're looking at reflecting on teaching. So then within those, we drill down. And um, a concrete example would be side by side. If you're talking about engagement in, um, in the classroom, then um, say in Chris training in high schools, that's a model that we use. We have um, those strategies going on and a literacy um, TIL might teach that and a technology trainer would then be able to also go side by side and say and this is how you can integrate technology to do that. So that's just one example. Our mentors are really experts about reflecting on teaching so they can be our lead learners there. We're really already starting to kind of implement the model and engage people and we just have uh, some learning to do and our goal is to be ready to go by the end of May so that over the summer we can um, have people training and working and then hit the ground running when we come back. And That's when they hit the round, ground running, he said that, um, I don't mean you referred to you as he, but that. That's yeah. all right. Uh, you're talking about training cross-categorical and mm -hmm. all of that. So all of these, by the end of May, these people will be trained in that well, format? we're going to have our plan and, and then the, so they're going to be having to spend some okay, time Okay, well, we, we always have a lot of plans. When are we going to be ready we're to, going. to go ready. with the model? We're already going. We're already moving forward on things. And, and this training that we're going to do in the summertime, how much is it going to cost us? Well, we always have been able to bring our, um, our schools together, our um, ILTs together in the summer, and we are able to pay for that out of Title I and Title II dollars. Um, I don't have an exact figure on that, but, um, but we have that budgeted out of, those, out of those dollars. Not in the Ed Fund. Not in the Ed Fund, right. It's professional development dollars. Okay, so I, I guess my, I'll give up in a minute. When I suggested several meetings ago that we go through the budget to see what where our money is and where we're going, something that we never really did, um, my thought was also that we would include where we get title dollars and whatever other grant dollars that we get so that we can see where everything is utilized. Um, because if we talk about strictly about the Ed Fund, our, some teachers are paid out of some title dollars, right? Okay. So are we going to be able to save any positions through title dollars? I doubt it, right? Well, one of the reasons that the answer is largely no is that the, the largest fund is Title I, and when you get Title I dollars, you are not able, you are not allowed to supplant. So what that means is that you can't cut teachers out of the Ed Fund and supplant them in the Title I uh, Fund. The, the feds that give you the money will not do that. So uh, the, the short answer to your question is no, you can't save cuts in the Ed Fund in any of the title funds. You, now, we'll continue to receive title dollars and they'll be very important to us. We'll spend them in Title I, Title II, Title IV in appropriate ways, uh, but we can't, if you will, save the day in the education fund budget with the Title I, II, II or IV budgets. That's, and that's not new news, that's very old news. But you know, given the, the answer that Kathy just gave, I was in the uh, teaching and learning meeting last week when they were talking about those four domains. 
And I actually, in the moment, said I'd like to propose a board meeting to you all. And, and I am quite serious here. I think in a future board meeting, and I hope you'll do it before I'm gone, but if you do it after I'm gone, I think it'd still be a really rich experience. But what I'd like, I, I have a video that I'd like for you to see, and it's a real short one, and I'd like for you to reflect on that. And I'd like to put seven board members in a conversation with with uh, a couple of teachers, a couple of principals, and a couple of TILs or people from the Department of Teaching and Learning and have you hear how this all integrates uh, from the classroom to the principal um, uh, to the support from the Department of Instruction and how this all fits into producing better learning for kids in a classroom. Um, I think it would be interesting and I'm kind of old-fashioned but I think every once in a while engaging a board in a conversation about our core business is kind of a smart thing to do we spend a lot of time talking about other stuff and once in a while they engage in in a conversation about teaching and learning in a classroom uh, is is worth your time and the other so it, it's interesting then that you ask a question that allowed Kathy to answer in that area but I think I think it would be very helpful to answering those questions <coughs> so that you can see what do these people what do these teacher instructional leaders really do that, that supports the work of a principal or supports the work of a teacher? And we'd bring teachers and principals into that conversation. You asked some questions I know I didn't answer, but I lost them. So I just want to go back. Is there anything you asked that didn't and didn't get answered before we go? Well, I made uh, yeah. a couple different statements, but you know, I I have concern. You say that this doesn't affect, these cuts do affect children. And uh, oh, I, no, I have concerns. Oh, I, have oh, I concerns didn't say that. I know you didn't say it didn't, but you said programs don't, don't affect programs. And like IMSA, is, to me, is a very important program. Um, well, since everybody's had all these discussions, where are you in trying to look forward, or forward thinking in <coughs> looking for the resources to maybe <coughs> fill those gaps. Has anybody started that process? Well, I, I, can only sp I can only speak for me. Anybody's a lot of people, but I speak for me. My thought is once we get through the budget cutting that, I, that it would be a part of my service going forward to this district to help you think about your long range budgeting issues and, and priorities. Um, uh, I'm fairly confident in saying if you don't do that, you're just going to repeat this scenario year after year after year. But, but I want to make sure no one else understands. There is nothing on this cut list, nothing on this cut list that does not negatively impact students in this district, teachers in their classrooms, principals in their office, programs that we run. Uh, so if maybe you misunderstood me, but I want to make it clear, every single one of these cuts negatively impacts all across the district. Um, um, there's not any, we're not cutting any frills here. Every one of these things are essential services that a, a vibrant school district would want to provide for its, for its citizenry. This, this is not, we're, we're not trimming fat here. We're cutting into muscle and sinew. I've got several actually, and what I'm going to do is I'll just go down my list, and if there's a jumping off point, I'll <coughs> shut up and let people talk, and I'll get back to it. First off, did you were you able to find those numbers? Um, Eleven at Springfield High. Thank you. Eight at Southeast, and seven at Lambert. Okay. <coughs> and remember, these are just regular ed teachers. The special education teachers are separate. Yeah. And actually, that's my next question: Is we reduce that cut from nine to eight? Right. What's the difference in the number? Fifty-one three is the number we're reducing. Is is the number that's consistent across here? So, what would the overall total for that reduction for the special education teaching positions? The eight mm -hmm. we have right here: four five nine thousand. That's fifty-one thousand. So it would be uh, not fifty-one three. So less fifty-one thousand. Four zero oh, eight. That's what the number would okay. be. That's what I needed. Thank you. Okay. So minus 51. Go back to that. 
Um, in terms of librarians, um, one of my major concerns, and this has been a cut that's been discussed for several years and put in, put back, put in, uh, is we discuss that if we don't have these elementary librarians in the positions, we'll be relying on volunteers. My concern continues to be that um, depending on the school and how involved the neighborhood, the parents, what have you are in, some schools will not have a problem with this at all. Uh, they will be able to fill the, the, um, the libraries, check out <coughs> books, what have you, while other schools are going to have a hard to impossible time to fill the needed volunteer positions. So, which kind of leads me into the volunteer coordinator position, so I'll hit that one at the same time. Um, some of you already know, my, my day job, what I actually get paid for, is I work with volunteer coordinators around the state, do professional development and all of that. So the profession of volunteer coordination is really important to me. And I think a nonprofit or a governmental organization, especially this big, cannot survive without a volunteer coordinator of some sort. Now, is our volunteer coordinator doing the job that that person needs to be doing to actually recruit volunteers? That's questionable. Uh, I, I know specific programs are being covered, but if she's doing 50% of her time just writing grants to keep her program alive, which mainly is Real Men Read, and I understand that, um, that concerns me in terms of eliminating a program uh, head and the only person who handles volunteers. So what I'm getting at here is we are eliminating librarians in hopes of having volunteers handle it. And then we're turning around and eliminating our volunteer coordinator whose job should be, if it is or isn't, it should be, to recruit volunteers for the district. So those two combined I see as an issue. And again, some elementary schools will be able to cover it, but some, and specifically some on the east side and northeast side of town, I think are going to have a problem filling these positions. Realistically, how often do these 4.5 librarians do schools get service a week? Uh, most schools one day. One day, one full day. Depends on the size of the school, but that that would that's a fairly decent estimate. If you will. Some may get less, some more. And some of those are supplemented by uh, volunteers, though, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. McFarland, um, um, I appreciate that you shared with me the question that you just raised in advance so I could have a chance to talk so, to some people today. And again, based on recent past experience, it's the opinion of the people that I talk to, which would be um, uh, people with past principal experience, that um, likely volunteers to um, step into the green That, that the likely that, that principals would be the likely recruiter of the volunteers okay. and not the volunteer coordinator. Okay. Uh, now, uh, and, and I, I, I want to say this, and please do not hear this statement as one, to, if you will, to further justify cutting the volunteer coordinator. It's not spoken in that way. Uh, I had a long discussion with the volunteer coordinator today who recounted what her past, her recent past experience has been in the district since the position was eliminated that, that uh, Mr. Sherman <coughs> held. Uh, and this would be true of the webmaster as well. Okay, so in the old chain of command, the person who was in the director of community communications or whatever that position was called, that person was the supervisor of the webmaster and the volunteer coordinator. And frankly, since that position was eliminated, these people have been out there fending for themselves. Um, and so in my conversation with the volunteer coordinator, what I can tell you is uh, she appears to me to be a very bright and capable person whose talents are being sadly underutilized. 
Uh, and so if that's, if I think of that both from a personal individual perspective or from a positional perspective, what I would say is in bringing it back, uh, we really need to give some thought how to get maximum capability out of that position. Uh, I, I can't speak for the past more long ago than before Mr. Sherman left, but since that time, I, I'm confident to tell you that we've not maximized the use of the volunteer coordinator. Oh, I completely agree with you on that. And what I would recommend doing on this reduction, the volunteer coordinator, is not reducing that position, but restructuring it. I see volunteer coordination as a return on investment that cannot be lost. Um, yes, it's one of those where, and, and I agree with you, we should be looking at position reduction that isn't teacher related, but I just, if it's not being, if the position is not being handled accurately based on the idea of vo recruiting volunteers district wide, it should be. And I think the person in question can do that. Um, it's just a matter of job description more than anything else. But uh, removing a volunteer coordinator from a school district, I, I just don't see how the savings of $50,000 um, equates to the actual savings. Um, going down the line here, on the IMSA, we discussed uh, alternative funding for that. Is that alternative funding guaranteed, or if we don't find the funding, then it does go away? I would answer the question, no, it's not guaranteed, okay. and yes, if you don't find it, yes, it goes away, okay. or you could restore it. Okay. I just didn't know if we already had a grant in mind or, right. okay. Uh, you know, I sort of, I, I, I was a little cautious. I don't want to leave the impression that by my ordering the list into first level and second level that I've preempted sure. your ability to restore whatever you want. And, and so please hear me say, uh, for me, th the two lists are more of a, a, a chronological depiction of our conversations more than anything. Uh, so uh, th the Board of Education uh, has the authority working with your new superintendent to restore whatever you want and whatever priority order you determine, and that's the way it should be. So, Moving on to the page two, uh, coordinator of video and television services. Have we ever looked at monetizing this position um, where we, if we do film athletic events, academic events, what have you, that we charge a fee for it and that way we can continue to operate um, Channel 22, but more importantly, I think actually just video services in general. Um, I'm more, con as a direct TV subscriber, I don't get Channel 22 anyway, but I'm more concerned about video in general from our events. So I don't know if that's a potential, if we ever looked into that. Um, and if that could be a way to have the cost savings without um, reducing the position. Right. I can only answer that in my experience, no, we've never considered your suggestion. And, uh, you know, it sort of fits in this general question of other things that we could consider that would be revenue generators. You may recall that, that um, Mrs. Moore raised the question last week about is there any potential in the, the district um, um, uh, selling um, its um, information system <coughs> to other school districts. So, uh, I mean, there's a whole area of are there are there income or revenue potentials in some services that we take for granted? And and you know, you've raised another one that I would say I've not thought of. So and so, yes, it could be. I hate to see us start charging ourselves for it, but if we can charge yeah. outside entities, that's what yeah. I would look for. Um, now, webmaster, and I think you kind of hit on this already, but I'm just going to ask again, how would we handle the website if we did not have a webmaster? Because obviously that needs to be updated thoroughly. Um, my answer to that is you have to have an, if, if you in fact cut those two positions that are there together, the webmaster and the tech trainer, that you can't just cut those two positions willy-nilly without some thought at some point about restoring services there. Um, I mean, does it look exactly like you're doing now? That I, I, I don't want to presume that the answer to that is yes, but I can't imagine anything but disaster if we have a website with no webmaster. Uh, 
you know, to those of us who access it and we get on it and we click and it all works, we could easily believe that anybody could do that. There's a lot of technical code that goes behind all those clicks. And then that website connects to that robust information system that we've got. And, and sometimes I think in technology, and somebody said this to me today, so with my apologies for forgetting, we're kind of the victims of our own success in technology. Um, th there's a, a standard of expectation in our system among staff who've been supported in very positive ways for a long time that our technology works and that our technical people can solve problems and that our website works and our info system works and so on. And, and we're taking some risks with it when, when we make cuts to these positions. And, you know, so I fully agree if, if and, I, and I'm not suggesting you don't make these cuts, but I am suggesting, and that's why I said what I did about the second page, mm -hmm. there's real risk you take on this second page if you cut all of those and restore none of them before next year stuff. Well, and I would, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Yeah. I would argue that. The, for the website specifically, the question isn't restoration, it's continuation throughout. I think before we make that cut, if we were going to make that cut, we need to have a plan in place to where there is no lapse in service. Um, the information we provide out there to parents and community members is just too important not to have updated regularly. Um, I, I've been kind of scatterbrained the volunteer coordinator, but I'll just say again, um, on average in Illinois, a volunteer hour is $23 an hour. So the return on investment for a volunteer coordinator, if done correctly, is immense and I just I think I would rather see that restructured in this a position before we even talk about reducing and cutting it the only other question I have right now is timeline we're discussing these cuts now obviously we will have the RIF meeting the second meeting in March um, but when we get to that RIF discussion will we have this broken out by cut as we go will we just the position cuts and if so well, how name, will we oh no it'll name names well I, I know that but in terms of the areas that we do not have cuts based on positions, for example, supply cuts, when are we actually going to vote on these? Are we even going to vote on or after the discussion you're going to go ahead and do it? How does that timeline work? So in the non-personnel items, unless you, t the, let, me, let me go up sort of to the big question. So where do we go from here? Yeah. So the next step is whichever ones of these cuts that you make, all right, now I'm going to divide them into two categories, personnel and mm -hmm. non-personnel. The personnel first is then we have to sit down and say, relative, for instance, to the, the teacher reductions, who is it that actually ends up, after all the displacement and all the dust settles from all these positions, which number of people get RIF notices and how many are there? Um, so, and at the next meeting, you would be asked to do that. Uh, people who are in jobs that there's one of a kind, there's one coordinator of video, there's one webmaster, there's one... Uh, tech trainer that's that's in this category and so on those people would all get noticed that their job ends at the end of the school year all right um, that's personnel side and the non-personnel side unless you said to me don't cut this thing we would go ahead in the preparation of the budget uh, reducing here and looking for other places to reduce okay. all right and that as we prepare that budget and bring it forth on a timeline that asks us, I think we put it before the board in May, and so it means that by May we've got to get it made. By the way, at that point we're probably still guessing on state aid. Uh, but again, this is what I used to call the tentative budget. It's, I don't think we call it that anymore. Let's just call it the budget. Uh, and then you're going to approve it by the second meeting in June, right? By the time you improve it at the second meeting in June, you're probably just going through honoring a legal commitment to have a budget on file and you probably already know that you're gonna be making some changes in it. Hopefully you'll be into negotiations and wrapping them up and you'll know what your state aid is and you'll know what your clearer revenue and expense picture is. So I think the earliest at which you probably can be in conversations about restoration will be the time when you start to get a clearer picture on your state aid. And, and as, as I've said to you before, the, 
the infuriating thing about the school budget, budgeting process is if you don't make personnel cuts now and you need to later, you can't. Of course. And so we always end up having to overcut here and hope that we can restore later. Because if you get yourself cut, caught down in July with a million dollar deficit, you can't cut staff then. It's, you, you can't. Is it staff or teachers? That, that's the staff. General so staff. staff all together. Staff. Okay, because I thought RIFs applied to other personnel besides teachers. Okay. And just a follow up when you mentioned general state aid. First off, I would love to see general state aid go up, but I'm anticipating not. So I would say 89% is our, hopefully, we keep at 89%. Um, but one of the things I would like to see this district do, either on the board level, administrative level, or both, we are the district for the capital city, and we are not involved in this process, and that is aggravating to me. I think we should be working with senators and house members who are working to update how we fund education. We need to be lobbying for more state aid, showing them that we're reducing again, and as Mr. Vasco pointed out, this five million is almost exactly the difference between 89 percent and 100 percent. Mm -hmm. If the state would just fund us the way they're supposed to fund us constitutionally, we would not be making these reductions this year. So the capital is a block down the street. We need to be more involved in this process. Than well, we're I think we also need to hold them accountable when they they come out here and, and politicize that they're for education and and then they don't yeah. hold up to it. <laughs> I would I would like to make a point here. I don't want to cut one thing on the on either one of these pages. And I don't think anybody up here does. We're going to have people come up here and talk to us tonight about please don't cut my program. We're going to nitpick it because we all have our little picadillos here that we don't want to see cut. But the bottom line is we are $4.7 million in the hole. We have promised the, the citizens of this city when we all campaigned this year that we were going to get this budget under control. So I think we need to think about that before we start picking this apart. I don't want this, I don't want that, because we're going to be back in the same problem next year we're in this year. So I really think we need to think about this. We have got to cut $4.7 million. I think we need to be responsible to the citizens of Springfield and show them that we can balance the budget. It's painful. Like I said, I don't want to cut anything on here, nothing, because I know it's going to have an effect. But I don't feel like we can move forward with anything we're going to try, will we get more state money or we eventually go to the public and ask them for, for, for more money, I think we're going to have to prove to them we have our house in order. Now help us, because we've done everything that we can do. So it's just my, I had to get it out there because we got to cut some stuff. You guys both done. I'm going to yeah. say a couple things. All right, I want to interrupt. Um, I'm with you, Mike. We have to balance the budget. I just have a couple concerns I emailed that to you guys Daryl and you guys and the board saw it and at the, about the life life what the health life safety fund my question is you talk about that work well there's also painters plumbers and you mentioned water leaks I mean can we do the same there if you're talking about hitting these bricklayers and laborers which I don't agree because there's still work that I sent pictures on from last year still haven't been fixed today it's almost a year ago and we're worried about painting plumbing and those are very expensive to the district I mean but you're hitting this small group of people and that's why I was wondering why we said this and not painters and I see we're posting for a utility job on the web which makes no sense to me for cutting in that part so I don't understand how we're I'll go first and let you tag team me, Daryl. Um, you raise a good point, you know. So um, uh, I think the decision goes like this. If you were going to roll the dice on um, the services provided by one group of the trades, which is the one that you would roll the dice on, that if you had a problem, you could best survive a bad situation in the moment if you had a problem, okay? Well, if you had a serious plumbing problem, uh, that would lead to lots of other problems. So in, 
in my opinion, it wouldn't be wise to be thinking about laying off plumbers, okay? Um, all of the infrastructure for technology is done by electricians. So if we didn't have electricians, it's more than changing light bulbs and, and changing light fixtures. They're essential to our installation of technology, which we're continuously upgrading. So for me, electricians stand high on the list. Um, I think the group that you ask about, that probably comes closest to being next for me would be painters. Uh, what's the impact if you, it, it, what's it take us now, 17 years to make a cycle to paint all our buildings? Yeah, that's, that's very close, 15, 15. You know, so if you cut painters, it might go from 15 to 17. That means the building gets painted once every 15 years. So, you know, I'd have a hard time arguing you that arguing with you that a painter was more important than a bricklayer. Uh, and then I recuse myself from the conversation of carpenters because uh, there's too many of them in my family for me to be objective about carpenters. Um, but um, truthfully, in the day-to-day -day stuff that breaks and falls apart at school, it's the carpenters that go out and fix it. If it's, if it's not plumbing or electrical and stuff falls down or the ceiling falls in it, at Du Bois School like it did one time a long time ago and so on. They're the guys that go do it. I mean, could we do this differently and, if you will, spread the pain over all the trades group? Probably. Um, uh, what it would involve then would not be cutting uh, two bricklayers uh, and a laborer, but it would involve many more furlough days for all of the trades across all across all categories. Uh, how many furlough days are the trades people taking this year? Currently they're set up to, uh, well they're taking six this year. Uh, we help, we were going to hold that yeah. uh, to that number. Um, right. It could be increased. Yeah. And, there, and I, there's I think one item we don't, yeah. we don't have a lot of say in um, is we get their, we get their rate from the the from the hall, right. from yeah. The hall. And uh, that's the only way we can adjust their pay rate. So, I mean, we'd have to, I mean, an alternative if we were going to cut here, and it would be to inc significantly in increase furlough days. And then we, <coughs> then we raise the question about routine maintenance and, you know, when do you do it and uh, uh, all those kinds of things. And it's kind of a circular argument. and. I mean, so, you know, you could trump everything I've said by how can you be certain that the problem will, the fixable problem will be a masonry problem and not a carpenter's problem or that it'll be a carpenter's problem, not a ma And the answer is, I can't. I, I can't justify it. And what about the utility position? The utility crew. That, that we have a the utility. utility position is a, a replacement of a person that uh, has chosen to go to the National Guard and has gone to the National Guard. Now, do we have to replace that even though we're cutting in that um, that level of uh, number at that in that group um, I believe it's six um, is uh, is optimum for for what they do um, allows them to, to plow like we have been um, that would be impacted if we didn't have that other person um, maintenance of the fields during the summer. <clears throat> we take three people out of that group um, for a, a good portion of the week to uh, maintain Memorial and, and Southeast and uh, Lee. Um, so that leaves us with only three during the, during those, uh, once those start to be maintained, once, once the grass starts to grow, um, we're out there. Uh, maintaining those fields and for for the activities that are there, the soccer, the spring and fall soccer, the track season, and all those things. So, so yeah, having one less person there is is an impact for that group. Gotcha. Does it have to be? That can be directed and you know, discussed and directed. Mm -hmm. 
right. And the last thing, um, I'm not going to take up a lot of time. We discussed at the budget workshop, uh, brought up, kind of looking, and I agree with Mike, I was one of the people about a year ago complaining about we have too many administrators here, and I was false on that, so I apologize. We don't have a lot of administrators. I think, now the salaries have increased, I agree on that, uh, but we haven't increased in numbers. And I know at the high school level, it changed from the guidance deans to the APs. And I really think this board, Ms. Gill, looking forward, we should really look at this because that is a huge cost for this district uh, to have everybody has a title of AP at the high school level. Uh, so I really think moving forward, that could save us a lot of money. As you know from my comments last week, I really think that the guidance model at the high school ought to be one of the first things you take a look at. I, I agree with you completely. And I would agree with that also because I think um, our money could be better spent on some of those positions. I have two questions if I can go. Are you done? I'm done. Okay. So we didn't uh, replace the director of technology, which is somewhere around $120,000. And when you talk about the reduction in the technology expenditures from the Apple lease, you said we were going to maintain 600000 of that. <coughs> so that leaves you another 800000 So we're almost back at a million. Where is that money being put? I didn't and follow. $920,000. Uh, I didn't follow. I didn't follow. I, I, I we got did lost. not replace the director of technology. Mm -hmm. So that's the hundred and twenty thousand dollars that was in the budget, okay? And then but you're, it's not. Wait in a minute. The, wait well, a minute. just let me say it's not in this year's budget. It's was, not in this year's budget at all. No, the, you you lost that one last year. So so there's no savings to cutting that position this year. That person left last year, and and the position was not replaced. And there's no money in the budget. The position and the money are not in the FY14 budget. The money was cut out altogether? Yes. Hmm. Uh, uh, I can't chew that. <coughs> but you still have $800,000 coming back into the budget of the Apple lease. No, Where no, are you eight, putting no, that money? No, no, 600000 Actually, five. No, you said you. Well, just hang on. Mm -hmm. The Apple lease is 1906000 So the difference between that and one four is five oh six. Okay, and then there's another hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of technology that's in there that's being maintained. So five hundred six plus one twenty-five is six hundred and thirty-one thousand dollars, roughly, that will be left in the budget. It's in a line item called technology. It's in the Department of Instruction budget. It will be in next year's budget. The line right now is two million. So where are you getting the extra half million in in this technology budget? I, the, the Apple lease, I've never. Every time you hear it, it's a different figure. It's either one, one nine or one four. I thought it was one four. One nine oh six, in some sense. So it's the only number I've ever seen on it. Am I right, Joe? Yes. Okay, so if you're. Technically, it shouldn't have been in this budget, in the upcoming budget anyway, because the money, I mean, it, the lease had already gone away. So that should have been back in the plus column, right? The excess, other than the $600,000 which we talked about. Am I right? That, that's what we're saying is going to happen. So you, then that, in that case, that would be $1.3 million. So where, where did we put that $1.3? I'm totally lost, Judy. I'm not tracking what you're asking. All right. If we had a $1.9 million for the Apple lease, which expired. It hasn't okay. expired. We're still paying on it this year, this year, but we don't pay for it next year. But we're paying it this year. Okay, so we got it. We got it in the budget this year. Right. Okay? Right. So we're not going to pay that money next year. Right. You're reducing that line. By one point three million dollars. No, one point four. Well, one three one four. Okay, hundred thousand dollars. Okay. So where are you putting the money? That's why I, my question is, where are you putting that one point four million dollars? Well, it's distributed across paying 
paying for all these various and sundry things that we're trying to do to balance the budget. It's paying for, I mean, it's not directly moved to some place. So you add up, you add up all the savings, and and so if you go back to that visual that I put up, you're going to take in 4.7 million dollars less next year than you spend. Okay, so in order to make up 4.7 million, 1. 4 million of it is the reduction of the technology line which gets reduced from from 2 million 100,000 or some or 2 million right under 2 million 100,000 and it gets reduced down to 600 and some thousand subtracting out 1.4 that 1.4 million then is allocated to paying for 1.4 million dollars worth of expenses that are still in that budget I mean, so none of these is a direct trade of I take this hundred thousand and spend it on that. I take this one fifty three and spend it on that. I take this two fifty five and spend it on that. It adds up all of this to cut four point seven million dollars. That gets spread to get about pay, paying for everything that's in the budget. It's it's not a dollar for dollar trade like this line for that line. It just seems to me like you would have one point four million dollars in excess to add back into the to the bottom line or whatever you're going to work with next year. So you would reduce some of this. I, I don't. I, I just don't see what that money is. Is there anyone else? Yes. That's, that's making up. Mm -hmm. this. But on this issue, is there anybody else that doesn't see where this money goes? Oh, on the lease. Yeah. I just want to make, I don't want to go away from it if others are confused. Uh, and my best suggestion is, is that you and I sit down and uh, away from this and I do try to do a better job of explaining. Yeah, because I need to know, I need to know where you're putting that $1.4 million. <laughs> you're putting it on something else, the budget. We have a $5 million deficit we have to pay for. So, you know, $1 million, $1.4 million out of that $5 million yeah, but deficit got is going more somewhere else. Going here so really, right really what it's going to is teacher salary. 80 some odd percent of our budget is teacher salary. So that $1.4 million is going to go pay for teachers we couldn't pay for with deficit. <clears throat> I'd like to do these right now. Karen? Mm -hmm. We've done ahead of time. Well, why don't we have them go? Okay. Yeah. No, Let's okay. do that. Right. Okay. Well, why don't we finish our board questions first? If we have questions. Well, these are people from the public too. They but we were having a board discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, with the two positions for the webmaster and the tech trainer, are those the t only two individuals that run those programs? Uh, the webmaster, yes. The, the tech, tech trainer, trainer, no. Okay. Uh, there, are, but that's a complex, that's a sh short answer to a complicated question that's not totally accurate okay and the person who's going to give testimony may actually clarify that okay. so there are other tech trainers but there's no one else in the job category that she's in okay okay and who maintains the each school's website I don't know each <laughs> she does I can speak to all of okay that. okay so my only question is is this close enough yeah. Okay, I didn't know, you know, I feel like I'm a long way from that microphone, right? Okay, I'm Karen Thompson. Mm -hmm. I am your second level cut in the tech trainer box. And when I found that out this afternoon, I thought I need to speak. Um, seems like I shouldn't not speak because then some of you may think uh, she's not passionate about that anymore. She's been doing it for 20 plus years. She's probably tired but I'm not. Um, I went into that position in 1993 when Dr. Hill and Mike Kalinga said, we've got a vision. Technology can improve instruction, engage kids, improve the day-to-day -day classroom environment. And I had been working with them for three years in a part-time kind of put it together 10 hours a week kind of position. And finally they said, we've got to create a position and that's why I'm in a different position and why you say I sit alone in that position because I'm the only certified teacher working in that position that not is, is not in a certified position. Because in 1993, that's what we could do. 
And so we said, let's start. And we began building student-centered technology environments. I'm part of a team. When Dr. Hill said, I think she's trained thousands, I thought, I brought statistics today on what I've done with my 1,000 hours in the classroom this year because you wanted to know how I directly affect instruction. But I didn't bring numbers on how many people I've trained, but I can smile and tell you that I work with staff members who do remember me in third grade and will probably tell you what I did in their third grade classroom when I worked with them and their teachers. So things have changed a little bit in 20 years, you might imagine. I started the email server that serves the K-12 schools in Springfield. I put together the first web page that our vision was a web page that served all of the schools, all of the districts in one place. Not each school doing their own thing because I work with schools in other parts of the state. I came from the um, tech conference Friday. That's why I was not here Friday to talk to Dr. Hill <coughs> until today. And at that conference, I heard from teachers who said, oh, Karen, we don't have one web page for our district. Each teacher makes their own decision. And so some of them have Weebly pages, and some of them have um, Yahoo pages, and some of them have Google pages. But I'm proud to tell you that we have an environment where every teacher, student, and staff member has an email, a web page if they need it, a Google account, an intranet account, because we built a product that's all in one. And you say, well, Karen, but you probably really don't affect the kids. And so I started to try to make a list. I know that of my 1,000 hours this year, that's, you know, that's approximate. If you want total facts, I am uh, math and physics trained, so I'd be happy to give you total facts. But I can tell you that 20% of my day is spent in classrooms, one-to-one -one classrooms heavily, because I support this year elementary. 40% is spent collaborating with teachers, ILTs, backwards planning, looking at how their programs come and core, what are the applications that they need. And 40% is spent working on the intranet. I've had set up tech support, web page support, just-in-time training. When it breaks, it's not good, right? You need it now, not in five hours. I am passionate about that student-centered technology infused, working smoothly. <coughs> And I can tell you, well, I am the person who said to Dr. Hill today, we make it look too easy. Sorry, I've observed that in 20 years, that when budget cuts come, we say, that web page is fabulous. It just runs, doesn't it? Hmm. No, it doesn't just run. You know, the instruction that's happening with kids, it doesn't just happen. And Mike, when he hired me, used to introduce me this way. I could have bought more computers, but I decided to buy Karen. So <laughs> the fact is, if we just buy technology, we don't get the bank for a buck, but we think we do because it looks easy. Cost of a laptop per student per year today might be roughly $200. Cost of teacher and student training, it's pretty expensive. But the cost of a well-integrated system where technology improves instruction and we can communicate with parents, staff, <coughs> students all in one place, that, I tell you, is priceless. Tanya Flynn Sullivan. Superintendent Hill, members of the board, thank you for again allowing me to speak to you. I'm guessing you're getting to know me by now, um, but my name is Tanya Falloon Sullivan and I'm the parent of an IELTS third grader. I come to you tonight to urge you to keep elementary libraries staffed with the professionals who are most qualified to meet the, the needs of our diverse students in District 186. Like web pages, libraries don't run themselves. And although the suggestion has been made that volunteers could handle it, I think Mr. McFarland really addressed that quite well in saying that the schools where our students need library services the most are the ones who are least likely to be able to staff the libraries the way that they should with volunteers. I know that's true for my neighborhood school, Harvard Park, um, and that you know I have a lot of concern for that for next year. 
Um, I told the previous board last year uh, in making the very first time I think I addressed the board how shocked I was to find out when my daughter entered District 186 as a kindergartner that there were only four full-time library positions for 20 plus elementary schools. I teach in Williamsville. We have one full-time library specialist you know, who has a master's degree for three buildings and we have full-time staff in every building, you know, aides who staff the library in every building all day, all week. Um, I heard last week uh, that a comment was made that since the libra libraries were um, only open, or since the librarians were only in each building one day a week, that what's the difference anyway? Well, to me, that's akin to a doctor telling an overweight patient, well, since you aren't exercising, five days a week, you really just better not bother at all. And, and I don't agree with that philosophy at all. Um, I uh, really think that the wholesale cuts um, would be a major detriment to our students here. Um, I asked my daughter, and I would have brought her to tonight, but she has ISATs in the morning, and I wanted to make sure she got a good night's sleep. Um, but I did consider trying to bring her, but I thought it would, would run too late. Um, but I asked her what she felt she had gotten from her interaction with a librarian. This is her first year in third grade. This is the first year she's ever seen her librarian in, and been to the library on a day when her library, library was staffed. Her librarian is Ms. Cox, um, who is at Isles and several other buildings, and she's absolutely fantastic. And so I asked Ellie, I said, what, what do you think you've learned this year? And she said, well, I never knew about the Dewey Decimal System, and proceeded to tell me all about the Dewey Decimal System. Um, we take her, my husband is really the person who does this, to the Lincoln Library every single week. He never misses taking her to the library. Um, and, and I, you know, often go, but that's kind of their time. Um, and she's never mentioned the Dewey Decimal System because the children's portion of Lincoln Library, they, you know, they don't use it. It's by alphabetical, by author's um, last name. But she said, well, now I know that I can use the big part of the library if I ever need to because she understands that. Uh, another thing that Ms. Cox has done is um, Ellie's done quite a bit of homework for library. This was optional homework, but um, the students have been encouraged, and this is throughout her schools, and if you look at her blog, and I would encourage you to look at Ms. Cox's blog, the students have written about Bluestem and Caudill, I believe, award books, and uh, every they have to write four entries, a review of four different books that they've read, and then they're eligible to vote for um, their award, and the voting takes place here soon. Um, I believe it is this month. Uh, Ellie was really excited to write those. She was challenged by the project. I remember you know, kind of helping her and sitting next to her at the computer as she wrote them in. She wanted me to check to make sure she didn't have any errors before she submitted them. Students, have you'll see a wide variety of writing abilities, but I would encourage you to look at, at what those students are doing. They are writing, which is absolutely something that they need to do at these younger grades. Um, without a librarian, my book crazed daughter would still miss out, um, to be sure. But what I really want you to think about are those students who have no access to libraries or books outside of their classroom. She has books exploding onto her floor, but many, many of our students don't get even one, except for maybe the free ones that they take home through RIF. And, you know, that's, those are the kids who are going to lose out because they don't have that encouragement, they don't have that push to become more literate. Um, Joe Biden said, well, regardless of your feelings on Joe Biden personally, um, he, he was actually quoting his own father when he said, um, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. And I hope that the district will take that into consideration as you look at, at what I know are very difficult cuts for you to make. I know that none of you wants to make any of these cuts. Uh, I know that, you know that they are painful, but I get concerned when I hear that you're talking about the responsibility to the citizens to make the budget you know, fall into line when I think that your first responsibility should really be to our students. And that's what I hope that you will consider as you make <coughs> these difficult decisions. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments about budget cuts? Yes. Um, I just have a concern about the reduction in the special education services. And 
our ability to still fulfill our obligation to provide an appropriate education for these students. And <coughs> it's my understanding that we as a district, we can't be reducing our services to the stu these students. Okay. Uh, actually, the very last comment I was going to make was about this uh, issue of maintenance of effort in special education. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a requirement <coughs> that districts maintain effort in special education. It's a complicated formula. Uh, I won't bore you with all the details of that, but generally what it says is that school districts, even in the times of budget cutting, cannot um, uh, act in a way that diminishes services to special education students. Um, so um, let me sort of take the various cuts line by line. Um, uh, the reduction in the tuition to the Lakeshore program I don't think is impacted by maintenance of effort, okay? Um, the cut of the 10 special education attendants would be. Uh, I think it's the most problematic of the special education cuts on here relative to maintenance of effort. Uh, it is very clear that until we know the IEPs of every single student in the district who has one of those for next year, it's impossible for us to know the exact number of attendants that are necessary to fulfill the requirements of those eight IEPs. What we're doing here is recommending uh, eliminating 10 of the positions in the event that it is not possible for us once we see all the IEPs uh, to, to make a cut that deep because of our requirement to meet the needs of all students in their IEPs uh, and, and to maintain our effort then we'll have to put some of those back. So uh, I cannot emphasize strongly enough that uh, this is tricky territory. All right. Relative to the high school teaching positions, remember that this is being made possible because both special educators and regular educators there at the high school level will be teaching, they'll have six contact periods a day with, with students and not five. Uh, uh, so because of that you can cover more kids with the same number of staff so the cuts at the high school level will not re require us to underserve any student who's there uh, the, the exact people they come in contact with change um, uh, we are you know, you know, I've obviously talked to Ms. Baker about this. We're monitoring this situation closely. The, um, um, I can't tell you with exact certainty that um, every provision of maintenance effort will be fulfilled or sustained, but we'll know that going forward. Uh, but uh, I can say this. The recommended cuts in special education in no way are an attempt for us to subvert the special education law or diminish in any way our commitment to serving the needs of every student in the district who has an IEP. Um, in the first week in March, minus the completion of all the IEPs for next year, it's hard to be certain about this, whether we were making cuts or not. But one thing is, and I go back to this, if we downstream realize the potential of efficiencies, once you get past the next board meeting, you cannot reduce staff anywhere across the district. Uh, and so what's being recommended here is a place for you to give yourself the latitude to reduce the budget if you are going to, in fact, attempt to balance this budget and it's unfortunate that that the laws governing when when and what you can cut play out in such a way that you have to take this very proactive painful position months in advance of knowing what your state aid dollars are but it's been this way in Illinois for a long time and the only way that we can possibly consider a more efficient special education program or staff special education in the same way that we staff regular education at the high school level. The only way is to make these cuts now. 
because it won't be an option for you and, uh, after another 13 days roll off the calendar. And then you're stuck with whatever decisions you've made. And, and so uh, you raise a very legitimate point and please hear me say I'm not 100% certain that we can sustain all the cuts that are recommended in special education due to the incompleteness of IEPs and because of the requirement to maintain effort. Okay. It's a very legitimate point to make. This one secretary, elementary secretary position, it, it's vacant, it's in, so does that leave the one building without a secretary or was there more than one? And it's a place yeah. where there's more than one. Yeah. And it has been vacant for a while, right? Is it vacant right now? Yeah. They have a, uh, we allowed a half day sub to finish the year when the person left. Okay. We have someone there morning only to assist. It's a very large school. Okay. But that, but that, but we did not fill the position because it was on the list of possible cuts. So we just throw somebody else in the overload. Pardon? So we just we hired a part-time person. Yeah, but are we going to hire end up hiring a part-time person or a sub to fill those positions? No, that's, that's not cost saving. That's up to you. No, we wouldn't do that. Right. We there won't be a position for that. They person. did have two full-time people, and rather than hire someone full-time, we were trying to find cost savings for the rest of this year, and then leave next year up to the board. Okay. I had another question um, at our. Our uh, workshop on Monday, you mentioned about administrative interns, that you were going to look into that area to see if we might ha have some savings. Thank you for reminding me. So here's what I found out. All the administrative interns are taken out of the building allocations. So what it means is that if a, st if a school wants to have one, they have to put it into their staff allocations. So all the administrative interns in the district are in somebody's staff allocation. A principal chose to allocate a position for the person in that role. Does it make sense? It does make sense. They're making that choice in lieu of, you know, spending, you know. In lieu of a classroom teacher. Exactly, yeah. Right. So, okay, I mean, that's. The impact on RIF is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if, if you bring all those people out, they're gonna bump the same teacher out, so. The impact on RIF is n zero, right? And I would strongly suggest that staffing allocations at each building are the appropriate province of principals. Yeah. They're likely to make a better decision on their needs than I am from here. Uh, uh, and so they're obviously determining that that's a high level need. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so as we discussed, though, administrative interns though have become basically disciplinary positions. So, what options does that leave the board if they're taking the money out of their allocation to redefine those titles? Well, I talk about short term and long term. Uh, uh, again, I guess if the boards, I, I, if I track what you're saying, if you said we won't, don't want schools to have administrative interns that just do discipline, then we would have to, in the long term, rewrite the job descriptions for uh, administrative interns um, and say to people, if you keep them, they got to do what's in the job description rather, rather than whatever it is that they're doing. Because an internship, technically, if you teach it in school, is not a lifetime position. If you teach the term as it's defined. I, I would certainly agree with that, that I wouldn't expect someone to be in an internship. I, d I don't see an internship as a long-term position. Yeah. Say, so, hey, what you all need to do now is decide what motion somebody's going to put forward and act on so that I know what to do in working with Mrs. Sherman about putting this stuff in place.
and this was, this goes back to my timeline question. I, I'm, I'm wondering what kind of motion we would make if the personnel reductions are going to come up in the RIF meeting anyway, and then any uh, thing we do not remove from the list of cuts that you've mentioned here will go into the budget as is. Um, I'm wondering what kind of motion you're looking for. Well, so let me make it easy and recommend one, and then it gives, there you you something, go. <laughs> then it gives you something to shoot at. <laughs> I mean, I, re I recommend that you make the first and level, first, first and second level reductions as listed, and that going forward, uh, the RIF reflect those reductions, and going forward, that as um, uh, the picture becomes clearer about resources available to the district, you hold open the option of working with your new superintendent to uh, restore uh, that which the, the board and the, and the new superintendent determined downstream are feasible for you. So it's a three-part. Make these cuts, proceed with the rift that's in these cuts, and hold yourself open to the fact that when your revenue pictures are better known, that you revisit this list of cuts to determine what, if any, and in what order you want to return any of these cuts or add the positions that I mentioned earlier or whatever. So I recommend that <laughs> action. Somebody else needs to do that. And then we'll get a second. You, can we? So moved. Because we need to have a motion before we can even talk about this. Yeah. So, so moved. I'm going to second. Sorry. Somebody? And I actually have some amendatory motions in a second, but I have some discussion. Oh, God, don't start that again. <laughs> Sorry. I got two. Mike, second. Okay. Anyone have any discussion on that? Is um, there any discussion? Okay. I have, I, I would like, discussed. I would like to motion to amend that motion to remove the 4.5 positions for elementary librarians and the volunteer coordinator position. That's my motion. Nice substitute. Now you need a second. I'll I'll you a second. I'm playing parliamentarian. Yep. Now, you, now you need a second to that. Yep. Okay. Do we have one? I haven't heard it. The secondary motion is to remove the volunteer coordinator and the librarians from from the cut list. There's no second. Oh well. Okay. There's no second to the motion, so you can't discuss that one. Nope. So no, we can, well, I'll second it, so okay. we can discuss right. it. There okay. we go. Now okay. it's seconded, so <laughs> now your discussion has to be limited second to, kill to the secondary motion, which is, do you eliminate, do you take the volunteer coordinator and librarians off the list? That's what you're discussing now. These are the two that I've said before, I think, and it was mentioned by the member of the public, literacy is our number one goal of this district. And I don't see how we can, and I completely understand, and I'm one of the ones who has asked for as many cuts as possible, but this one, I don't see how we can say literacy is the number one potential uh, output of this district, and we don't have elementary librarians. I would argue we need to find the money to have a fully staffed library in each of our elementary schools. We can't do that right now, but I would like to work towards that, and therefore, I don't support this one reduction. And the volunteer coordinator, I've said again, return on investment for volunteer coordination greatly outnumbers $50,000, and that's why I want to keep that one as well. We did get a second. Yeah, we got a vote. That's our, I know that's our status now. We have, okay, the substitute motion was, vote, was voted down. Huh? No. No, was no. It? no, you're no. voting on you're the voting. substitute. On the substitute, okay. We're going to remove these two from the line and then we'll vote on the full right. thing unless somebody else wants to remove something else. If you vote yes now, you're voting to remove those two librarians <laughs> and volunteer no. coordinator from yep. the cut list. That's what a yes vote means. Which, now. just in case somebody's playing ball on this, that would make the total cuts uh, roughly, I'm sorry because I didn't do the math initially. Um, well, if you want the math, I'll give it to you in a second. When my phone decides to work. Um, come on, come on, come on. Total amount of cuts if we remove these two would be three oh four. 
one. What? No. Three hundred four thousand one hundred. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Forty-seven six hundred. There we go. Five million two hundred fourteen thousand three hundred forty-two dollars. Oh. We're still mending items. No, no, no we have, have to vote on this one first. Then we can yeah. go back. Then and you can go back and amend other stuff. Shall I call the roll for this? Uh, any other? Dis any more discussion? No. Nope. Lopez. No. McFarland. Aye. Moore. No. Zimmers. No, and I want to explain why because I don't want to start nitpicking this because we're going to end up right back where we started because we're all going to have our little things that we're going to want to eliminate. So I just want to explain my vote. I'm voting no. Flamini? No. Thunderbird? No. Johnson? I'll vote aye. That is two ayes and five noes. The motion fails. Now you're back to the original motion, which was to approve the cuts as presented to go forward with RIF based on those cuts and to revisit the cut list for the possibility of restoring programs down the line when your revenue picture is more certain. Yeah. I'm going to amend bricklayers, two positions, and labor, but I want to just discuss something. So you want to remove it? Yes. The cuts? Yes. We need a second. Yeah, what the heck, second. Okay. <coughs> Discussion. Uh, I'm hoping, um, I don't know where this is going to go for vote-wise, but I'm hoping if this doesn't pass that Mr. Shaver down the road, we can figure out how we can bring these guys back with furlough days or anything like that. I, I don't know if the board's willing to look into that. Miss Gill gets back here. We never know because they got laid off last year and brought back. So that's my discussion item. <coughs> No. Zimmers? No. Flamini? No. Thunderbird? No. Johnson? I'm going to vote no. But like I said from the beginning, I think none of these cuts. I'm not for any of these cuts. Lopez? Aye. <coughs> that is one aye and six no's. The motion fails. Now you're back to the original motion. Anybody else? I would like to make a substitute motion that we would um, maintain the position. I don't know where her title is. She's a uh, tech trainer. Tech trainer. Okay, because actually, when I came on board to this school board, she is the one who helped me get through the process of learning how to motivate through the technology. And you mean Karen? Karen. Yeah. Yes. And I think that she provides a valuable service to this district and to this my usual phrase, capper at the knees is not good. I think this is a position that needs to be maintained. If we're gonna as I always say, if we're going to move forward in this world, oh. we've got to keep moving forward and stop stepping back. And I think she's part of the reason that we have been able to move forward in this district with our technology pieces. Well, discussions, she's the main reason. Discussions already happened, but second. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're just acting like Congress. Give the speech first, make the motion last. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, any more discussion? Moore? No. Zimmers? No. Flamini? No. Thunderbird? No. Johnson? Aye. Lopez? No. And McFarland? Aye. That is two ayes and five no's. The motion fails. Okay. 
Have we, have we, we need to vote on the original motion. Do we need to vote on the original okay. Not amended. Can there be any discussion? Not amended. No, you want to just talk about this now? Well, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, voting on the original amendments here, there needs to be a time where we can come together and prioritize, you know, well, first of all, come up with our goals as a district and prioritize if we are going to be adding some of these items back into the budget. You know, what are they going to be? Because everybody has, you know, we'll know all these are so important. Until the circumstances of that time right. are available and the amount yeah. of money that we could get. Um, yes. That would dictate, basically, or limit where, where we'd be able to go. Well, but even, I mean, we can still have our vision and then come up with our priorities. So then when we, the money does become available, we'll already have a plan in place where we're going to put it. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Zimmers? Are we voting not? Full, yes. 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 Full. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just clarify here real quick. A vote of yes on this is to approve the, um, the, original. the original cuts that Dr. Hill presented this evening. A vote of no is a vote against yeah. going through with those. That's correct. Okay, I'm going to vote yes, except for middle school teaching positions, and I'm going to abstain on that because I have a conflict of interest on that one. Oh, okay. okay. Let me just get that down real quick. Okay. Um, let's see. Flamini? Yes. Thunderbird? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lopez? Yes. McFarland? Aye. Moore? Yes. That is seven I votes with the noted abstention by Mr. Zimmers on the middle school teaching positions. We're to consent action items. Uh, Mr. Flamini, members of the boards, I recommend your approval of consent action items 9.1 through 9.14 as listed in the agenda letter. So moved. So moved by Judy. A second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? If no discussion. Okay. Flamini? Yes. Thunderbird? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lopez? Aye, but present on 9.8. Okay. We're not that far. Oh. Yeah, it's 9.8. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 9.8? Yeah. 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 Okay. McFarland? Yeah. Aye. Moore? Aye. Zimmers? Aye. That is seven I votes with the noted abstention. Okay. Roll call action items. Uh, item 10.1, approval of personnel recommendations. Ms. Sherman. President Flamini and members of the board, the superintendent recommends adoption of the personnel recommendations as presented on the electronic school board. So moved. Second. Discussion? Discussion. No, we're tired of discussing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Member Burke? Aye. Johnson? And come back to me, please. Lopez? Aye. McFarland? Aye. Moore? Aye. Zimmers? Aye. Lumini? Aye. Johnson? Aye. That is seven aye votes. Motion carries. Okay. Adoption of the amended uh, FY14 budget, Mr. Basco. Further from me, members of the board, the superintendent <coughs> recommends adoption of the following resolution. Now, there be, therefore, be resolved by the Board of Education of Springfield Public Schools that the amended budget for FY 2014 is hereby adopted for said fiscal year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Okay. Very good. Johnson? No. Lopez? Aye. McFarland? Aye. Moore? Aye. Zimmers? Aye. Flamini? Aye. Thunderbird? Aye. That is six aye votes and one no. Motion carries. The next item is the approval of preparation of the fiscal FY 2015 tentative budget. This is the action necessary to direct Mr. Basco to begin the process. Mr. Basco. President Flamini, members of the board, superintendent recommends adoption of the following resolution B 
be it resolved by the Board of Education of School District Number 186 in the County of Sangamon, State of Illinois, that Dr. Robert C. Hill and Mr. Joseph Basco are hereby appointed to prepare a tentative budget for said school district for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2014 and ending June 30, 2015, <coughs> which tentative budget shall be filed with the Secretary of the Board. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Lopez? Aye. McFarland? Aye. Moore? Aye. Zimmers? Aye. Flamini? Aye. Funderburg? Aye. Johnson? No. That is six aye votes and one no. The motion carries. Uh, the next item is approval, approval of a change order for Matheny Withrow Elementary School. Mr. Shaver? Yes, uh, President Flamini, members of the board, the superintendent recommends the following resolution. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Board of Education approves the following change order and directs the superintendent to execute the necessary documents on behalf of the board. This is for Matheny Withrow School uh, in the amount of 18,388 to O'Shea Builders. And it was for uh, Art Surface Playground uh, area at, uh, at on the north side of the building. So moved. Second. Real quick, this is out of the original health life safety bond for the construction, correct? So I mean, that's what this budget is coming out of the health correct. life safety funds for that project. Yeah. Okay. Can we down the road in the meeting soon just get an update of where we are with health life safety again? Sure. in terms of plans for the coming years and where the amounts are? Correct, yeah, thank you, Candy. I'm just curious why this change order... Took so long? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the rush to uh, get the building occupied out there at the end, uh, um, the, some of the change orders that were at the close to the end and the paperwork, we're just cleaning up the paperwork actually processing the uh, final payment for that project and uh, all their all their uh, all we call them close out documents have been submitted um, and uh, there was just some final paperwork to clean up the architect um, didn't process them in a, in a timely manner they forgot the they forgot to bill us for this part of the work and, <laughs> and then we closed the books on it and that's why it has to be a change order right um sort of no it was going down <laughs> oh. there's a final payment in the, in tonight's uh oh, checks in, okay. in tonight's yeah. uh, yeah. uh, uh just the make a so um <laughs> this is this is the one one that was over eight thousand <laughs> or over ten thousand which is a board approved uh, requirement and so uh, so it's nothing that we overlooked? No. Okay. No, they just took their sweet time in processing okay. the final paperwork. All right. Okay. We'll be ready for the roll. Mm -hmm. Yep. McFarland? Aye. Moore? Aye. Zimmers? Aye. Khomeini? Aye. Funderburg? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lopez? Aye. That is seven aye votes. The motion carries. Mr. Flamini, members of the board, it's my recommendation that one 10th grade student be hereby expelled from further attendance at Southeast High School through the end of the first semester of the 2014-2015 school year with a program and that one 8th grade student be hereby expelled from further attendance at Lincoln Magnet School through the end of the 2013-2014 school year with a program. Aye. Zimmers? Aye. Flamini? Aye. Thunderbird? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lopez? Aye. McFarland? Aye. That is seven aye votes. The motion carries. Okay, the next regular meeting is Monday, March 17th, 5.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Meeting adjourned.